Thank you very much. You... It is worth noting that John Lawkland, a British citizen when coming into the UK to give this speech and to meet others, he was detained for hours by the Border Force, Counter-Terror Police. He had all his electronic devices confiscated and was grilled on his political opinions. You, I want to talk about the Ukrainian war. The Ukrainian war, I think, is a Russian doll. You all know Russian dolls. It's got a little doll inside and then there are two bigger dolls on the outside. The small doll in the middle in the center is a Ukrainian civil war. It's often forgotten that Ukraine is itself in civil war. I might come back to this point in a minute. Then you have, of course, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, which we all know about. And we have a third doll, the largest doll and the most frightening, and that's the one I want to talk about, which is that this war is a war not just between Ukrainians, not just between Russia and Ukraine, but as I'm sure many of you in this room know, a war between the West, the collective West, and Russia. And that is, of course, what makes it so incredibly dangerous. Uh, as you also know, this war is being fought uh, by the West against Russia in three ways. Uh, militarily, Stefan has mentioned the uh, arming of Ukraine that we all know about. Economically and diplomatically. I want to talk about each of these three ways in which the war is being waged uh, in turn. Last week, or this week, we heard a lot about Ukrainian military successes. Ukraine has had a couple of uh, successes uh, near Kherson, near the town of Kherson, and in the region of the city of Kharkov. Uh, and these uh, successes have been talked up in our media uh, as if uh, President Zelensky were Marshal, Field Marshal Rommel in 1940. He's going to be in, on the Volga by next week, just as we were saying earlier about Russia uh, ploughing her way through to Warsaw and Berlin in a matter of months. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the Ukrainians boasted last week, or this week, what are we today, Saturday, this week, that they, are, they, had, they had conquered 500 square kilometres in one week. And that was why they had uh, retaken the initiative. 500 kilometers, 500 square kilometers in one week. Russia holds 120,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory. If Ukraine carries on at this phenomenal rate of 500 square kilometers a week, it will take 240 weeks, you could do the sums yourselves, to reconquer the 120,000 square kilometers which Russia holds. 240 weeks is about four and a half years. And this, of course, this amazing advance, these 500 square kilometers, does not take account of the well-known fact, but like so many well-known facts, the West doesn't recognize it, and so the West imagines that it can make it go away. The well-known fact that Russia has, of course, mobilized uh, 300,000 reservists. 200,000 of which have already been registered and are, as far as I know, in uniform. 200,000 reservists is more than the entire Ukrainian army. And of course, these two or 300,000 Russian soldiers will come in addition to the uh, ones that are already there, the 125,000, I believe, 150,000 that are already there, facing an army which has fewer than 200,000 soldiers in uniform and which has probably lost. I had lunch, I'm, I'm based in Budapest at the moment, I had lunch with the, foreign, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Hungarian Parliament who reckons that the Ukrainians have lost between 50 and 100,000 men in this war. So, as you all know, Ever since the fighting started, ever since the 24th of February in our wonderful media, the Russian invasion has been failing. Don't you remember the battle for Kiev? Oh, Russian bungled invasion. It's like reading Edward Gibbon, you know, a thousand years of decline. Um, this uh, war, which has been going so badly for so long, has led to, uh, whether it's recognized or not, the conquest of a gigantic uh, amount of Ukrainian territory, equivalent to half the size of the United Kingdom. Uh, the annexation of that territory, whether you agree with it or not, uh, adds uh, 
8 million uh, people to the population of Russia. It gives Russia the industrial basin uh, of Ukraine and, of course, a large part of the famous Black Earth of Ukraine. And uh, the annexation, of course, uh, is a very substantial escalation in the sense that now Russia declares this territory to be her own, to be part of Russia. Uh, and uh, as you also know, in response to that, Ukraine, uh, Zelensky did a little photo op where he signed a letter with his prime minister and the head of the parliament. And on this letter, they asked for rapid accession to NATO. Well, it's very interesting to see the reaction to this rapid accession, to this request for rapid accession. Because on the 2nd of October, uh, <clears throat> nine Eastern European states, led by Poland, Poland, Romania, the Baltic states, Slovakia, Montenegro and Macedonia, issued a declaration saying that they agreed with this idea and that they stood by the idea of Ukraine joining NATO and so on. However, all the big NATO states have remained silent. The United States, Germany, Britain, France and Turkey. And among the smaller states, Bulgaria, uh, the Bulgarian president issued a statement saying that he had refused to sign this joint declaration because he said, no, uh, we can't talk about Ukrainian membership of NATO until such time as peace has been established. A statement which is in complete contradiction to the policy of NATO and the European Union, which is that there must be war in order for the Ukrainian territory to be liberated. So at the moment of greatest escalation by Russia, because we've been in a phase of escalation, of cyclical escalation, uh, ever, since the, um, uh, ever since the conflict started, NATO has blinked. NATO has blinked. And all this stuff about not recognizing, we're not going to recognize the accession, uh, the, the annexation of the four Ukrainian regions, is nothing but uh, dust being thrown into our eyes to obscure the fact that Ukraine, that Russia now controls this vast swathe of territory, controls nearly the whole of the Black Sea coast, uh, and uh, as I say, a uh, vast, uh, vast amount of territory. So in my opinion, I may be wrong, I'm not a military expert, the uh, military side of it does not look good uh, I believe, at the moment, for the collective West. There are people who think, including arms dealers, American arms dealers, who think that the Ukrainians will push the Russians out of the four regions and maybe even out of Crimea by next spring. Perhaps we'll meet again uh, <clears throat> next year to see who was right. But right now, I wouldn't bet on it. Those are my comments about the military side. What about the economic side? In a way, the economic side is almost bigger because it attracted more attention. The uh, delivery of arms is, uh, it's difficult to say how it's going. Of course, the promises have been enormous, uh, but the Russians control the airspace of the whole of Ukraine, in addition to occupying about a third of the territory. And uh, there are doubts as to how much of this weaponry actually arrives. Of course, some of it arrives, but I imagine a lot of it is destroyed. So it's the economic side, the second aspect, that has attracted the most attention. On the 3rd of March, the French finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, uh, declared, proclaimed a total economic war. Wir wollen den totalen Krieg. Uh, we might remember a previous minister saying that. Nous allons, nous allons déclarer une guerre économique totale, a total economic war against Russia. Nous allons provoquer l'effondrement de l'économie russe. We are going to provoke the collapse of the Russian economy. Well, how's that going for you, uh, Bruno, that collapse of the Russian economy? It's not going terribly well, is it? I don't know if you've seen uh, Gazprom's uh, profits for the first half of 2022. Uh, the figures are, um, there are so many zeros, I can't even tell you how many zeros there are. The profits of Gazprom, which as you know is 50% uh, state-owned and which uh, contributes a very substantial sum every year to the Russian state budget, for the first six months of this year uh, was greater than the entire profits of Gazprom in the years 2021 and 2020. I'll just say that again. The profits in the first six months of 2022 were greater than the profits over the previous two years combined. 
So the uh, economic aspect doesn't seem to be going very well. You may recall, I'm sure you all do, that uh, Joe Biden said at the beginning of the crisis in early March that the sanctions had reduced the ruble to rubble. <laughs> the ruble fell indeed from about 75 rubles to the dollar to 100. So there was indeed a very uh, radical drop. <clears throat> well, again, that doesn't seem to be going very well either because the ruble is now one of the strongest performing currencies in the world. It has now gone up to 50 rubles to the dollar. It has risen against all the world currencies, including uh, the poor old euro. Uh, these facts, these figures, I'm not saying that the sanctions don't have any effect at all, but they are without any doubt not having the effect desired. Instead, they are of course having the famous boomerang effect that Stefan has, always, has, has already referred to, uh, energy crisis in uh, all the major European economies. Uh, and uh, the prospect of uh, power cuts and gas cuts for the whole of Europe um, this uh, winter. A crisis which has been provoked entirely uh, by the European Union sanctions. That's what made the markets go crazy. That's what, of course, there was the background of green policies. That's a, it's a very important point which Stefan reminded us of. The price of gas had been rising in 2021. <clears throat> Why? Because if you're going to go for windmills, you have to have gas. Gas and windmills go together, so the more windmills you have, the more gas you have to have. So there was already a right. Why? Why is that? Because, as you know, the windmills don't work all the time, and then you need another energy source to make up for it. So the price had been already rising, and incidentally, the gas producers uh, have always been the greatest supporters of windmills for that very reason. So it, was, it hasn't come entirely out of the blue, but of course the markets went completely berserk when, the, uh, uh, when uh, Olaf Scholz on American orders said that he would not open Nord Stream 2. So it is a purely home-produced crisis, which has, the effect of which is far greater on the sanctioning states than on the sanctioned states. Sanctions indeed have almost never worked in uh, international uh, history. They were integrated into the Covenant of the League of Nations in 1920. Article 16 of the Covenant of Legal Nations embodied the idea of economic warfare, which, because that's what we should call it, not sanctions. Economic warfare, or rather boycott, was the word used in the League of Nations Covenant. And they've had a very, very checkered history. Uh, there are very few examples one can point to of sanctions having worked. Uh, they, there are some examples, but generally they concern uh, very small countries which are indeed extremely uh, economically vulnerable. Uh, the whole idea that the collective West can provoke the uh, collapse of the Russian economy really does show uh, how out of touch these people are. Uh, Firstly, because Russia is not alone. I'll come on to the diplomatic uh, side in a minute. That's the third angle I want to deal with. But it seems to have escaped their attention that if you take, on the one hand, the G7, the group of the seven uh, most highly industrialized countries, and on the other hand, the BRICS uh, group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, <clears throat> and South Africa, I'm terribly sorry to tell the uh, leaders of the G7, but the gross domestic product of the BRICS countries combined is greater than the gross domestic product of the G7 countries combined and indeed has been for three or four years. You look at the graph, BRICS going up and up, obviously largely thanks to China, but not only China, and the G7 going further down. So the idea that the collective West can just, uh, at the click of a finger, um, uh, provoke the collapse of a country that produces all the things that people actually need, like warmth, energy, and food, and weapons, and other very basic things for peoples and states to exist. The either that the collective West, which is drowning in debt already, and uh, is largely disindustrialized, can do this, is completely crazy. Uh, Viktor Orban, I told you I'm based in Hungary uh, the, for six months. Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, said that sanctioning Russia on energy was like a dwarf sanctioning a giant. And I don't think there's any way, it's rather difficult to disagree with that. I'd just like to make a final point about sanctions. I, I, I'm, of course, mainly concentrating on the, an analysis of the balance of power. And, my, and as you can understand, my view is that they're not working <clears throat> any more than the military side is working. 
But uh, there, is a, a there is a one point I, I, I feel very, very strongly about for all kinds of reasons. As you all know, in English, the word sanction is a, means a punishment. A sanction is a punishment. That was not the vocabulary used in the League of Nations covenant. The League of Nations spoke of boycott and of economic warfare. And economic warfare is a better term, actually. But a sanction is a punishment. Uh, and yet, uh, in Europe now, particularly in Europe, uh, but also in the United States, uh, one of the clever things that the European leaders have invented is the idea of personal sanctions, where people are sanctioned personally. They have their bank accounts frozen and not allowed to travel and things like that. They are punished, these people. Only, only the day before yesterday, the European Union at the Prague Council uh, issued another list of persons, of people, uh, who have been sanctioned, who have been punished. And yet, of course, this punishment uh, is imposed without any legal judicial procedure, without any right of defence, uh, and by pure executive fiat. It is the most grotesque abuse of the rule of law and of the most fundamental principles that one can imagine. And uh, it appalled me to see at the beginning of the crisis how, uh, one after another, various uh, oligarchs, we, uh, as you know, the word oligarch is only ever applied to Russians, we never say Bill Gates is an oligarch or, or Jeff Bezos, they're not, they're just businessmen. But these Russian businessmen or Russian, rich Russian people who had houses in London or yachts or whatever, and they had their property taken away from them. The, uh, the idea that this could, should be able to be done without a legal procedure is profoundly troubling, because if they can do it to rich people like Abramovich or, or, or whoever else, they can do it to us, and they will. Perhaps you're familiar with the case of a, a poor bloke called Graham Phillips, who's taken up the Russian cause in the Donbass. He's from uh, East Anglia, as far as I can tell, for a perfectly ordinary bloke who did a few YouTube videos, and he has been sanctioned, a British citizen has been sanctioned with his bank accounts frozen and so on, uh, in the absence of any kind of legal procedure. So there are all kinds of reasons why sanctions don't work, and uh, recent history has confirmed the general trend. Firstly, of course, sanctions can be bypassed, that people find other sources. And also, paradoxically, sanctions, uh, uh, which I repeat are an act of war, they should indeed be referred to as warfare. Uh, sanctions, like warfare, like conventional warfare, always produce a counter, a counter uh, effect. Uh, Helmut von Moltke said the, the first, uh, the, all the, all, not, not a single military plan survives first contact with the enemy. Economic warfare is met with countermeasures. Uh, there are counter sanctions. Uh, we had this in 2014 when Russia put counter sanctions on European agriculture, which devastated large parts of European agriculture. Uh, and there's another element to sanctions, and then I'll finish on sanctions before going on to the diplomatic thing. Uh, is that, again, as in warfare, we all know that lots of uh, scientific uh, advances are made under, pr under the pressure of warfare, the invention of rockets, the invention of radar, all this kind of stuff. Well, the same goes for economic warfare. Uh, in uh, 1915, uh, during the First World War, when Britain imposed a blockade on Germany and uh, Austria, uh, uh, pre uh, preventing those countries from importing fertilizer from uh, South America. That was when the Haber-Bosch process was invented, which is the uh, absolute pillar of fertilizer creation and has been for 100 years in Europe. A process which, by the way, is now being closed down because the factory, the big factory in Ludwig ha Ludwigshafen, doesn't have enough gas. But that's an example of uh, a way in which a country under pressure uh, can find new resources within its own uh, economy in order to respond to the new situation that it finds itself in. And the same is true, as I say, of uh, Russia, which has been, as you know, under sanctions uh, since 2014 and actually since uh, 1947 in different ways, but that's uh, another story. So let me then uh, come on to the third uh, way in which the West, the collective West, is trying to fight this war. We've looked at the military side, we've looked at the economic side. What about the diplomatic side? As you, as you know, the collective West has tried to isolate Russia diplomatically, and we've heard from the mouth of uh, Liz Truss and other people that Russia is now isolated and has no friends. But I don't know if you saw a report in Bloomberg on the 6th of October. What day are we today? The 8th, so it's two days ago. Saudi-Russia Axis agrees to cut oil production by 2 million barrels a day. 
Do you know how many Western leaders have gone to pay court to MBS in Riyadh? Boris Johnson, Joe Biden, Olaf Scholz, and Emmanuel Macron. And what has the answer been? <laughs> instead of agreeing, forgive me that vulgarity, instead of agreeing to uh, the supplication of these Western leaders who all went to the court of the Saudi Crown Prince, conveniently forgetting, of course, that as we all know, Saudi Arabia invaded Yemen about seven years ago. Uh, Instead of him agreeing to uh, increase production, uh, or not to cut it, uh, it was a Saudi-Russian axis, according to Bloomberg, which agreed this two million barrel a day cut to, of course, keep the oil price up. This is, uh, in terms of diplomatic history, this really is a watershed moment. Why? because the post-world order, which was created in 1945, as we all know on the basis of the outcome of the Second World War, includes, among many other things, uh, 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 an axis between the United States and Saudi Arabia, uh, which was symbolized by the meeting between the, Saudi, the then Saudi king and President Roosevelt on, the, on board a, an American warship uh, in, uh, I think, near Aden, the, the USS Quincy. Uh, it's a very symbolic moment. Uh, this event has been invested with more importance than it probably really had. Uh, but the fact that Roosevelt went from Yalta, where the United Nations was set up and where the borders of Poland were discussed, to meet the Saudi king uh, and to discuss, among other things, uh, Jewish immigration into Palestine, but also, of course, uh, oil partnerships. The fact that this took place uh, the day after he left the Crimea, the day after he left Yalta, uh, has, as I say, given it a symbolic importance uh, which uh, it largely deserves. That American-Saudi access has now been replaced by a Saudi-Russian access. But it's not the only access that Russia has. Russia also has a very substantial partnership now, I don't know whether the word access is appropriate, with China. The uh, relations between Russia and China have been good for a long time now, uh, but uh, in the circumstances of the Ukraine war, they have grown deeper than ever. There have been really quite astonishing remarks. Uh, I've forgotten exactly what they've said to each other, the Peking and Moscow, but they've said, uh, they've used really very considerable hyperbole, saying this partnership will last forever, it's an extremely deep partnership, and so on. The partnership is both economic uh, and military. Everybody knows Vladimir Putin. Almost, almost nobody knows the name of any other uh, minister in, um, in Russia. Uh, maybe people know, they might know Shoigu, they might know Lavrov, but they don't know Patrushev. Nobody knows who Patrushev is. Patrushev is the head of the National Security Council in Russia, who went to Peking shortly after the Putin and Xi Jinping met in Samarkand to shore up the military aspect of the relationship with China. The reason why the relationship between China and Russia is so interesting is that it is a profoundly complementary diplomatic relationship. China has the economic firepower. China is the second largest economy in the world, soon to be the first. And Russia has the military firepower. And both these two gigantic countries need each other. Uh, and, uh, of course, as you know, the, uh, the economic partnership is absolutely immense. Uh, the various pipelines that uh, go from Siberia to China are, are the biggest construction projects uh, in the history of the world. And they deliver, uh, again, you know, hundreds of billions of uh, cubic meters of gas. Uh, and this... Uh, Russia-China axis is, is, not just a, is not even just a bilateral axis. I mentioned BRICS just now, the, the BRICS uh, uh, group of nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. 
Uh, that's one uh, international organization which Russia created some time ago and which has been growing. Argentina, for example, wants now to join BRICS as well. There are various other countries, I think, in South America that want to join it. Uh, when Xi Jinping and uh, Putin met in Samarkand, that was a meeting within the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Council, which again is about, I think, 10 or 15 years old, set up by Russia and China to uh, essentially talk about Central Asia. But it has uh, the, the, the number of states queuing up to join this organization is uh, quite uh, considerable. And in particular, Iran. Uh, is about to join it. When uh, Spigniew Brzezinski wrote The Grand Chessboard in 1996, he explained that American hegemony could only be maintained if the United States dominated Eurasia. And he explained all the ways that that would happen. Ukraine, of course, plays a very key role in this. Uh, and that's why he uh, is one of the main architects of the war that's currently taking place, because for him, Ukraine was a geopolitical pivot which the West had to control in order to uh, keep Russia down. Uh, and so he, he develops this completely crazy geopolitical idea of controlling the, what they call the world island. Um, and, uh, but he says something uh, absolutely prophetic, although I'm sure he doesn't, didn't want to prophesy it. He says in his own book, he says, if American, in order for American hegemony, world hegemony, because in, their, in the geopolitical language, so you have the world island, all right, which is Eurasia, and then you have this offshore island, which is the United States of America. So how can this offshore island, as it were, control the world island? That's, that's, the, that's the language. And as I say, there are various pivots which enable that. But Brzezinski says, uh, if um, China and Russia were to form an alliance, perhaps joined by other, I'm quoting, perhaps joined by other countries like Iran, then hegemony over Eurasia will be over. In other words, the scenario which Brzezinski warned about has now come to pass. It has now come to pass. And it's come to pass all the more perfectly that Brzezinski envisaged this alliance not as an ideological alliance. We in the West have ideological alliances. You know, by the way, why we're fighting this war. Do you remember the tweet of Richard Moore, the head of MI6, on the 25th of February? Do you remember that? MI, the head of MI6 tweeted on the 20th of February, as this brutal war is unleashed, let us remember what separates us from Putin, LGBT rights. <laughs> the head of the British Security Services. Okay, so we have ideological, we have ideological alliances. Okay, Our, the West is an ideological creation. Brzezinski says, if this Russia-China access with other countries uh, were to come about, which would not be ideological, but w which would be based on shared grievances and on practical cooperation, then it would uh, spell the end of American hegemony. And, uh, you know, there are never any permanent victories in diplomacy. It's a perpetuum mobile. Uh, but one of the things that strikes me observing uh, Russian um, diplomacy over the last 10 or 15 years, 20 years, uh, is its extreme uh, flexibility. Uh, I mentioned the Saudi-Russia uh, axis, what Bloomberg called the axis. Saudi Arabia and Russia fought a price war over oil two years ago. All right? But they managed to overcome their differences, and now they are an axis. Uh, one of the countries attending the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in uh, Samarkand was Turkey. Turkey, NATO member Turkey. Uh, Turkey and Russia, and by the way, Turkey and Russia also had a summit in Tehran, a, tri a triangular summit with the Iranians in Tehran, also, of course, to discuss energy. These countries, if you take Russia and Turkey, Russia and Turkey uh, ha are, have disagreements of a very radical nature in a number of areas. In Libya, for example, the proxy war in Libya, the Turks are on one side, the Russians are on the other. Same thing in Syria, okay? And plus the fact that obviously Turkey is a NATO member. And yet those two countries 
uh, have managed, in spite of their obvious, there's no ideological similarity between them. Is, Turkey is a sort of neo-Ottoman Islamist uh, regime and Russia is Russia. They have worked realistically uh, to bridge whatever differences they have and work together on the things that they need to work together on. And you can see this again and again and again. Uh, not just perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm concentrating on Russian diplomacy, but I'm sure you could see it, no doubt, on Turkey's own diplomacy with other countries as well. And yet we in the West, as I say, are imprisoned in this ideological, you're either with us or you're against us mentality. So to conclude, I'd like to invite you, if you haven't done it already, to read the speech which Putin gave in the Kremlin on the 30th of September, so last week, this week, in which he said a number of things which I think uh, are very useful for us. I'll conclude. Firstly, he described woke ideology and transgenderism as, I quote, pure Satanism. It's, it's pretty rare to hear uh, a politician talk God. We don't do God. But it's even rarer to hear a politician talk about Satan, and Putin did both in that speech. The second thing he said was, you can't feed people with, or, or heat people with paper currencies and debt. Maybe you can heat them by burning COVID masks. Uh, or maybe we'll heat our, our wood-burning stoves with uh, euros soon, or pounds. But he said, you know, to live, you need to have stuff, energy, food. And uh, he's made, over the years, a number of extremely uh, interesting uh, critical analyses of the casino economy that the West is in. And he uh, also made a remark, uh, which is that there are new geopolitical realities emerging. And this actually is the agenda of Russia in the war. It is to finish with the unipolar world, to finish with the idea that NATO should be the guardian of the rules-based international system, which is indeed what NATO says it is, and instead to move towards uh, a multipolar world order. And I think we can say that that multipolar world order has indeed emerged. I want to finish with a last remark on Poland because I was fascinated by what Stefan said about Poland. I wrote an article on the 28th of September, the day after the pipelines were blown up, entitled The Americans Did It, so we agree on that. <laughs> uh, but I also drew attention to the fact that that uh, pipeline, uh, Gregory, you said we're 25 miles away from France. Well, the pipeline is about 30, 40, maybe 40 miles from Poland, all right? The strait between Bonholm and, and Poland, Gdynia, is, is it's maybe 50 kilometers, all right? And uh, on the, on the uh, day of the <coughs> blast, uh, a se very senior, very influential uh, Polish figure, former foreign minister, former defense minister, former speaker of the same, Radek Sikorski, tweeted a picture of the gas coming up into, under the sea and said, thank you, USA. All right. But after I wrote my article saying the Americans did it, I, uh, of course I said that to explode the idea it was the Russians, but I am beginning to wonder if in fact the Poles didn't have uh, uh, some role to play. I've no, in, I've no speculation, I've no, I've no uh, proof of that. But whether they did or not, and if I'm right about the Americans, this shows, we're talking about geopolitical transformations, this shows that the Americans have dropped the Germans as their primary ally in Europe. And people say this in Washington, D.C. They say, it's not the Germans anymore, that's not our main ally in Europe, it's Poland. And if I'm right, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about the military thing, I could be wrong about the economic sanctions, I could be wrong about the responsibility for the blast. But if I'm right, it means that the United States, perhaps with the complicity of Poland, has committed what is, what would otherwise be called an act of war against Germany, because obviously the pipeline went to Germany. And indeed, I think that we are now seeing, independently of the big international 
tectonic shifts which are going on, where, as I say, power is moving to the global south and, uh, uh, and, and particularly around this new Russia-China axis. Within the European context, we are seeing this extraordinary development, which you've identified very well, Stefan, and I listen to you with great interest, about this new Poland. Which, and that would explain why, to everyone's complete amazement, Kaczynski started with, it wasn't, it's not 1.3 billion, it's 1.3 trillion. Was it trillion? Trillion! A million million. Yeah, so yeah. 1.3 trillion in one. So you think, well, why the hell would he launch, uh, as it were, a war? He's already, the, the Poles are already fighting a war on the Eastern Front against Russia. Suddenly, now they're going to open up a, a Western Front against Germany. That hasn't generally gone very well in Polish history. You think, well, hang on. You think, hang on, what, 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 what are they taking? And can I have some, please? Um, but if you think that the Americans have said to them, right now, you're the big guys, you're the ones that we are going to, then it makes sense. Then it would make sense. Thank you very much. Thank you.